Hello, FLI here coming your way once again with the second lecture or the second chapter for introduction to the human computer interaction course, which is being taught in the third year, Computer Science and Engineering Department. Um, so, as a way of recap, in the first lecture, um, we talked about what HCI is and we gave a, the, the details of the seven principles that are available in HCI. These have been highlighted in your, on your screen. So we said HCI, which stands for Human Computer Interaction, is first of all a cross disciplinary area that deals with the theory, the design, the implementation and evaluations of the ways that human use and also interact with computer devices. And from there, we got to know of the seven principles of HCI. And the first one, which is the know thy user, second through to the final one, which is the naturalness, which is the seventh principle. Now, while all these principles are very general and applicable in most of the areas and also aspects of human computer interaction design, um, there are certain guidelines that tend to be more specific. So on your screen, you can see table 2.1, which shows the major criteria and areas for which specific guidelines can be of help whenever we think about designing HCIs. So for instance, um, in the category, in the criterion of user time, as you can see here, um, there could be further specific guidelines for specific age groups or gender. So you can see um, for main category under the criterion user type, we can talk about age. And of course, talking about age too, we can also delve into the generation can talk about disability and, and accessibility, the gender of the user type, be it a male or a female, the consumer group, the occupation of whoever is going to use the application that we will develop, the culture, and also the country where the user originates from. And on the right side are the examples of most of the criterion or the criteria that we have listed over here. So for the user type, you can see we have kids, elderly, visually challenged in terms of disability, um, students, parents, etc., etc. Now, of course, the other criterion that are available is the platform or system um, setup, where we have the mobile or handheld desktop, large display. So in this area, the examples we'll be thinking about is the smart phones, the pad-like devices, be the desktop or the kiosk versions of applications or embedded OS and, and the rest. So of course, whenever when, when we talk about some of the organizations that are into HDI to and also we're thinking about the vendors, are the vendors in the private sector or in the public sector, are they um, into design style and identity, and these are some of the available examples under the vendor. So interface style, modality, um, technology, these are all examples of the criterion together with the uh, main category and examples that have been listed here. So you can see from here that we have um, the WIM or the WIM, which we normally term as an acronym for Windows, icon, mouse, and pointer. This represents the conventional desktop um, interface. So in most of the desktop applications that we have, um, of course, we will see a window, and within the window, we can see some icons, possibly on the desktop. And we can also see the movement of the mouse and also the different types of pointers that are available for our application. So, um, um, you should also have in mind that many of these guidelines in the category that have been listed in the table have also been put forth by a number of 
and ACR researchers and practitioners and some organizations over the years. And they consider all of these to be reasonably objective in terms of the criteria that have, we have listed in the table. To the point that there is even um, an international standard, which is the IOS or the International Organization for Standards, where they have a document which is a 9241 that guides the economic aspect of ACI designs. By economic aspect, I mean to talk about um, the study of the relationship of humans to the environment in which they work and also the application um, in the area of psychology and engineering to solve problems. Um, so the, the document, the 9241 document, which guides the economic aspect of the ACI, that was developed by the International Organization for Standardization. With this in mind, we also have topics which covers visual display and physical, physical input devices and in the work in the workplace and also environmental ergonomics and also some sort of public um, interactions. So these standards helps us to come out with these guidelines um, when we think of ACI. Now, um, broadly, when we think of um, these guidelines, we might divide them into two main categories. As you can see, we have the domain specific and the ones that are of general ACI designs. Um, when we talk about the, the main specific, as the name says, um, this is specific to the platform or the user that will use the application. So it is domain specific, so it's specific to the user and also specific to the platform that um, these HCI applications have been developed for. So we should also Note that in the, um, I'm talking about the general ACI design. So note that these guidelines can be relevant and also common across different categories, as shown in the table. So when we take an example like the guidelines for maybe the e-commerce application, it is very possible that um, these guidelines might also address different general ACI design issues such as the display layout and how to solicit for input from users, how to promote vendor-specific styles, and also how to target a particular user group. So although um, there are other general ACI designs, some of these guidelines um, run through for different applications. So the guidelines for an e-commerce can also run through for um, another ACI design application um, that uh, the user has been taxed to, the developer has been taxed to come up with. Now, you should also be mindful that um, even though the guidelines are much more specific than the ones, the seven principles that we talked about in the first lecture, it is still not very clear how to reflect them into an HCI design in a concrete and also consistent manner. But the fortunate thing is um, Tadwell, who is a researcher in ACI, the Tidwell, who is a very good researcher in ACI, has found a way to compile many interface, um, user interface or the UI designs, um, patterns in the form of guidelines. Um, we would represent that. Um, we'll, show, we'll show you that as we proceed on. So in, 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 in Tidwell's um, guidelines, he addressed many categories of the general ACI design. Because we said there are two of them in, in terms of categories, the specific and also the general ACI design. So Tidwell's guideline addresses many of the categories of the general ACI issues tabled out in the in the first table, as we saw, and such, such as the, the display layout, the input structure, the navigation, as well as the data and entry 
and even the aesthetic aspect of the application that is being developed. And of course, each of these guidelines um, illustrate specific UI or user interface examples with exact description of what is what it is and what it does and why and when it should be used. So you should have it in mind that such design patterns are of great help um, during the actual HCI design. You should have that one in mind. Now, there are examples of the HCI guidelines, and these are some of them that have been listed in here. Uh, we, should, we, should, we should have this in mind that it is not possible to list all, to list and also explain all of the guidelines that we all came up with um, in all the various aspects. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. So despite all the differences in the specifics, most of the common shared and equivalent or can be understood in terms of the high level principle. These have been represented in the few nine examples of ATI guidelines, as you can see here. So we will go into each one of these examples of ACI guidelines. So the guidelines are a little different from the, um, the principles that we've talked about. So we we'll talk about the visual display layout. And when we talk about visual display layouts, of course, we are talking about the general ACI design itself. And in the area of information structure and also navigation, and it still falls under the category of the HCI general design. Taking input also from the user also falls under HCI general design. Now, in terms of the user, users with disability, that is a user type of um, guidelines. So there are certain things that we need to do to be able to um, give a good experience to the users with disability whenever they interact with an ACR application. Um, mobile device as a platform, the icons that are displayed for the Windows and also the iOS um, um, software. Um, these are gender specific. And when we talk of and the earphone, that is the design for oral interface. We are talking about the hearing aspect. Earphone has got to do, or the oral interface has got to do with the, the ear, the listening of things from the application. We will delve into the cell phones in automobiles and a brief, we'll briefly talk about the e commerce as well. So let's take the first one. Um, as an example, that is a visual display layout, which falls under the general ACI design. So one of the main focuses in many of the design outlines, guidelines, is on the display layouts. That is the page that is being displayed for us. One of the main focus in many ACI guidelines. Um, the problem is, um, most of the time concerns with organizing and also um, giving relevant information. That is uh, both the content and also the UI elements in a, in a one visible screen or scrollable page. So when we talk about the visual display, this problem is more concerned about the organizing and also giving us or noting relevant information, um, both in the content and the UI elements in one visible screen or scrollable um, page. So generally, um, the display layout should be such that um, it is organized according to these four criteria. You know, this design layout, as we are talking about, the visual design layouts. It should be organized in a good way that will fall within these four categories. 
The first one is the information contents. And by information contents, an example can be the importance, the sequence, and the functionality of the information that we'll put in uh, on the page. So when we talk about the information contents in the area of visual display layout, we are more concerned about the importance, the sequence, and the functionality. So in, the, in terms of size, it has to be manageable. So the page, the main focus page, which is the, the display page layout, it has to be sizable, um, the size has to be manageable. Um, it's being manageable, we mean to say that it should be divided into proper sections. So we can have the header, we can have the footer, we can have the left, the right, and the middle center of, um, or the center of the page that will display the contents that we would want the user to, to notice. And another um, way is to find, is to get the attention of the user. And by this, I mean to say, we should be able to grab the attention of the user. So if the user opens the page, we sh there should be things on the page that will grab the person's at attention to prevent him from closing the page and visiting something somewhere else. And again, um, the, the, the layout should be visually pleasing. It should have some aesthetic you know, view. And by this, uh, we mean to say it has to be aligned with restricted use of colors. Um, we don't expect to see an application with so many colors running through on a page. You know, that um, tends to confuse the user and not allow the user to have a very good experience with the application that we develop. So, you know, with ACI, we were able to come out with all of these and come out with a, a very good visual display layout. Now, we're going to talk about um, a table. We have a table in here that I'm going to display to you that will summarize the guidelines for web page layouts, um, which have been put forth by the, the United States um, Department of Health and also Human Services, as the HHS, for the US government. So from the table, which is shown here in table 2 by 2, 2.2, can see the examples of the guidelines for government web page layout. So these are the guidelines that have been given to any of the government's web developers or yes, web developers to strictly adhere to these guidelines when they are producing or coming out with an application. So they have these guidelines in, in mind. So table 2.2, a summarize is a summarized guidelines for the web page layout. So from here you can see we have the guidelines. We have the explanation of each of the guidelines. So for a guideline like avoid cluttered display, and it gives the developer an explanation that the created pages that are not um, that, that they should create pages that are not considered. Um, cluttered by the user. You don't have so many things all at once displayed on the page. So the second guideline is to place important items consistently. So of course, for its um, explanation, you put the important clickable items in the same location and closer to the top of the page where their location can be better estimated. Uh, so that is why most of the time we have, when you have a web, uh, a web application or a website, we have the most important links displayed in the menu, the main link at the top or at the header. And within the main link, you can have so many drop downs um, that would, within an, each main link, we can have some drop downs that categorizes the different sections of the website. So these are all examples of some guidelines uh, that has been provided by the HHS, the, the 
Department of Health and Human Services of the U.S. to guide um, developers of the government um, web projects, people that are involved in web projects. So some of these are the things that they will have to get themselves abreast with and follow the strict guidelines that is being provided in here. So that is about the the um, visual display layout. Now let's talk about the second one, which is information structuring and also navigation. And of course, it also falls under the general HDI display. So here we can say a single display is often not sufficient um, to encompass all the required information content or to control the UI for a given application. If you have just a web a website that contains everything about um, about your organization, of course the website might be so lengthy, the website will be cluttered, the website will contain um, so many things that we need that that the guidelines would want us not to um, incorporate in a in a web in, in a web page. So of course, it is not the best of ways to come out with just a single display for your ACI application. There should be some links to take you to different places of the application. So of course, with this said, we can say that a single display is definitely not sufficient to develop an application. So with this in mind, we should be, uh, we can say that structuring the information and also um, making it easy to move. I move, I mean to talk about navigation from one point to another. Among the various items becomes a very important issue for high usability. So we have to find a way to structure it very well, the information very well, put them under menus and links and all of that. So the structuring information content um, structuring information content and also controlling the interface for the purpose of ACI is closely related to the principle of understanding the tax at hand. So if it is a news website, um, structuring, the, structuring the information content will fall under understanding the tax that is at hand. So in this case, it is a new website a news website, so if it's a news website, there are certain features and certain links that you will have to put in um, to make the, the user have a good experience when they visit our website. So by understanding the tax, um, we will be able to identify the sequence of the sub tax. So when we understand the tax that is being posed to us, we'll be able to identify the sequence of the tax and the actions that we need to take. And also, each tax will be associated with information either for making inputs or for um, bringing out outputs or results whenever um, such main um, menus are clicked. So the, the tax structure, the task structure, the action sequence, and the associated contents organization will dictate the interaction flow and its um, fluidity, how easy it is. So the structure of the tax and the action sequence and the associated, associated um, content um, will dictate how the interaction will, will be to the user. So in this way, um, only the right amount of information or control will be available at the right time. We don't put so many things on the main page. We can have just a little section of each of the important things that we want to talk about. So when we are at such sessions, it moves us to the right place to have, to be able to read or get the in-depth information that we are looking for. So aside from all such internal structure, it is also very important to, to also provide external means and the right user interface for fast and also easy navigation. 
So by fast and easy navigation, we mean to say that um, we find ways to enable the user to find the needed action. So we normally do this by using the, um, the menu item and the information also quickly. So the actions or the needed actions that are important for the information um, quickly. So that is the fast and easy navigation. But what that is what we mean by that. So we yeah, will find a way to also introduce a summarized guideline for the design of an easily um, navigated interface. Uh, we have other researchers that have dealt with some of these ways to do some of these. So whenever we talk about information structuring and navigation, which falls under the general ACI um, design, um, these are some of the things that you should always have in mind. We should first of all know the tax at hand. When we know the tax at hand, we will be able to know the action sequence and we will also be able to know the associated content organization and also the, the tax structure itself, if we can have an internal and external um, ways of displaying our information. By knowing the information structure and the navigation, we'll be able to do all of this. Now, let me show you a, a, a picture of how this has been represented. So if you look at this example, for instance, um, this is a website with a site map containing all the relevant links. I don't know if it's in, in the Korean or it's in a different language, which is not English. So, so these will be the main menu. You can see one, two, three, the main menu. And then these are the sub, this is a sub uh, menu under this. And within this one, we also have another sub menu, another sub menu. And for each of the sub menu, we have different menus in here. So there's a second menu and the rest. So that is one. Now looking at the old website too, we can also see that we can have the main menus in here, and within it we have sub menus. These are all sub menus. Within the sub menus, we have respective um, sub menu under sub sub menu under the sub menu. So these are all represented this way. But of course. And for this website too, you can also see we have media and press. We have these menus as the sub menu, and each of the respective links under each of them has also been displayed. So um, those that are interested in being able to get an XML version of their website, um, there you can go to xmlsitemap.com. So the sitemap of a website gives you all the links that are available on your website. So if you go to this website, xml-sitemap.com, and you input your, your domain name, which is the www.whatever.com, it will bring out all the links on your website. The ones that are broken, it will specify it for you, for you to work on each of them. Now, navigation refers to the method used to find information within a website. So these are the links that helps us to do all these navigation. So when we say navigation, it only refers to the method that we use to find information within a website. So a navigation page is used mainly to help users locate and also link to destination pages. So when we talk about a website navigation scheme and features, uh, we should have in mind that this will allow users to find and also assess information effectively and efficiently. So when possible, this means the designer should also keep in mind the navigation only pages short. So the designer or the developer of the website should keep navigation only pages short. So by this way, the designer should also include a site map and also provide effective feedback on the user's location within the site. So when you click on any of the links, we have something we call breadcrumbs for websites. So at any point in time, wherever the user is, he should be able to go back to the previous um, 
um, previous location that took him to his current um, location. That is the use of breadcrumbs. So by breadcrumbs, you are able to navigate back to where you came from. So the designer should be able to come out with a site map that will guide the user. Or we should also find a way to um, let the user know of his current location and also go to previous location so that the user will not be found wanting on um, a website. So usually to facilitate the, the navigation, the designer should differentiate and also group the navigation elements and use appropriate menus. So for example, what you see here, we can see about and under about, you can see UMAT administration registration registrar's office ICT. So these so things that relate to the registrar are found within the registrar office. Things that relates to property administration are found within administration. And from here too, you can see we under media and press. Things that relates to media and press are found in the media and press. An example of set things are the gallery, the happenings, the awards received, and the documented speeches. And you can see under that, um, gallery, we can have an events calendar, a photo album, a video album, and the rest, and so on and so forth. And the happenings, we can have a spotlight where we will display people that are in the limelight of the institution, be it an alumnus of an institution. Of um, of humans. We can also have news and events. So the idea is anytime we want to facilitate the navigation, the designer should be able to differentiate and group and differentiate and group. So this are differentiated and group. The designer should be able to differentiate and group navigation elements and use the appropriate menu types to be to be able to display such content. Um, easily. It is also important to use descriptive tab levels. Um, provide clickable list of um, page contents on a long page. So you can have a website that has a long page. So you should um, you should be able to have a session. So for instance, if you have an article of about two hundred pages, the article can be. Um, section in such a way that you can have a table of contents to the right or left of the article that the user can click and will go directly to set sections of the article. So we normally use in the web class, we use what you call the anchor tax. So when you click on the name of the anchor, it jumps you straight to the anchor um, or the session that the user would want to see. So I'm repeating again, it's also very important to use descriptive tabs, provide a clickable list of page content on the long or long pages, and add clauses where they would help users, table of contents or sessions, select the correct link. So in a well-designed site, the user, the users most of the time do not get trapped in a dead end pages. So when they are in the pages, they shouldn't be trapped in any way. So that is about information structuring and also navigation um, for the general guidelines that we are talking about. Now let's talk about, I'm still on, 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 on the guidelines, um, as a more concrete example, as you can see over here, um, we'll find ways to illustrate two design patterns um, that Tidwell um, came out with. I wish you note that um, as design patterns, very specific uses of the user interface elements are suggested addressing and also concern um, are suggested and are address um, are suggested addressing and all the concerns um, that has been talked about in the previous uh, pictures. So from here, you can see that this is the first one. Um, that is the figure 2.2. You can see that the, the use of two panel selector, for the two panel selector, we have 
those are two panels first panel and second panel i will turn that to the pane left pane and the right pane so the two of the um, the use of the two panel selector um, a design pattern is a, is a type of design pattern for information structure and also it facilitates navigation so from here um, you can see that each of them so uh, from here you can see that um you can see from here that um let's see so first of all as you can see from here we have the what and use when so these are the two design patterns that are available um see them um, two panel selectors that are available for this particular picture let's take the first one so let's put two side-by-side -side panel on the interface as you can see these are side-by-side -side interface so in the first we show a set of items that the user can select at will so from here we have so many things that are being displayed over here and it's the same thing that also is shown here we have a set of items that the user can select at it at will an example of the item is the um, this pc 3d object desktop and all of that these are the items that we can select now in the other so that is the first um in the first panel so in the other panel it shows the content of the selected item so in this case we have picture or pictures um item selected and now on the right panel we see the content of the the picture so for for, for the two side by side panels so there's a one and two this one lists all the con all the items available and by selecting any of the items the content of that item is also displayed here it's the same thing that is also shown here this is in black and white and it's in color so now let's look about it let's look at the second one so we are presenting a list of objects for the second one that you can see here we presented a list of objects for the second one um, categories or even actions and from here you want the user to see the overall structure of the list so these are the list of objects that have been specified this is an email um, the, how the email is being displayed over here so we have a list of um, objects categories or even actions that are available in here so david yao has a mail now when this is an action when we click on this one then the actual content of the information that is within this action or category is, in, is being displayed over here so you want the user to see the overall structure of the list physically the display you work with is large enough to show two separate panels at once so usually these are these are the two types of the mapping so now um moving on to the next um, general aci design in terms of the guidelines let's talk about taking user inputs as the name says taking information from the user as it's clear by taking information from the user it means you should have a form where they can enter their name maybe their age their sex stuff like that these are ways of taking information from the user so a clever design for taking input from the user usually we turn them um, in, a, in the form of raw information or system commands can really improve the overall performance and so in terms of both time and also accuracy for high interactive systems so in modern interface employed uh, so in most of the modern interfaces that um, we have they employ graphical user interface which is the gui elements and an example of such interfaces are the windows the text box the buttons, the menus, the forms, the dialog box, the icons, 
all of these and supported techniques like the auto completion, deactivating irrelevant option, voice recognition, and also devices, for example, like the mouse, the touch screen, to obtain user input in different ways. So in coming again, most of the modern interfaces employ these graphical user elements and also the support, um, support techniques and devices to be able to obtain user inputs in different ways. Give an example of such um, GUIs and the supporting techniques like the auto completion and the uh, voice recognition and, and the rest. So most of the time, um, it is up to the UI designer to compose these input methods for the best performance with respect to the design constraint. Um, an example of steps will be the user type, the tax characteristics, the operating environment, and so on and so forth. So let me give you a, um, a picture. In the next slides, and in this picture, you can see we have a collection of guidelines. Um, this is a collection of guidelines for use in applying these input methods to facilitate data information. And I'm going to let's talk about them now. From the illustration given here, uh, we can see we display. The um, display layer layouts and also the user interface for these two forms are used for facilitated data entry, selected selection menus, default values, access form, and all these are used to reduce error from the user. Um, in previous, in previous, I think in the previous class, I, I was saying that. Instead of you know asking the user about their gender for them to type whether they are male or female, it is best to give them the option to select so that they don't type wrongly like male and spell and spell male as M E I L. But you give them the you use the right form tab type or, or form tab to display and give them options to make a selection. So with this, we would, this will give um, this will not give room for errors, so it reduces the errors that the users will make when they tell a form. Um, there are some guidelines for designing user interface software, and these are the ones that I'm going to talk about. There are generally about um, eight of them. And the first one is consistency of data entry transaction. So as the name says, consistency of data entry transaction. So this is quite similar. Uh, and it's, it's a sequence of actions that needs to be used under all conditions. So um, that is about the consistency of data entry transaction. So similar sequences of actions should be used under all conditions. Similar delimiters, applications, and then so on and so forth. The second one, which is a minimal input action by the user. You want the user to input some few things. Once you give them the room to type unnecessary things into our uh, forms. So fewer input actions means greater operator productivity. So make proper use of single key commands, mouse selection, auto completion features, auto cursor replacement and um, placement, rather than typing, pressing in the full alpha numeric, um, numeric um, input. So the selection from a list, as I've talked about, give the, cause the user to make a choice from the drop-down menus or the radio buttons that you display on your pages to help reduce the possibility of errors. So you, you avoid switching between the keyboard and also the mouse. So you use default values just to make things easier. 
So if the user is using the keyboard, you can incorporate tabs into your forms. So that right after typing the name, as you see here, you can press on tab to move to the next element to fill out. Um, by so doing, you avoid the switching between the keyboard and the mouse um, in set application. So the second one is the minimal input action by the user. So you reduce it by giving them the choice to make a choice. The third one is the minimal memory load on the users. So when doing data entry, use menus and button choices so that the user do not have to uh, make a selection on a lengthy um, list of codes and complex and um, synthetic command strings. We wouldn't want that. And on the fourth one, we have the compatibility of data entry with data display. So in this way, the format of the data entry information should be linked closely to the format of displayed information. So that is where the WYSIWYG wig comes into play. It's what you see is what you get. In terms of the compatibility of data entry with data display, if you want the data that is being entered should be displayed exactly as it was entered. So what you type in there will be exactly what you are going to get when um, you retrieve the information from the system. On the fifth one is the clear and effective labeling of buttons and also data entry fields. So we use consistent labeling. So this is a way of um, this distinguishing between required and also optional data and entries. So by doing this, we place labels close to the data entry field. So clear and effective labeling of buttons and data entry fields. So from here, I see name is here and the entry is there. It makes it so easy and so clear and effective for the user to make the right decision when filling the forms. And you should also match and place the sequence of data entry and selection fields in a natural scanning and hand movement direction, top to bottom, left to right. So you can't start filling the forms here. When you press on tab, it comes here and the rest. It has to flow from the top to the bottom, from the right, sorry, from the left to the right section. There should be uh, a match and a sequence of data entry and selection in the fields. On the seventh one, make sure you do not place semantically opposing entries or selection options close to each other. Let's take an example. Do not place save and undo button close to each other. It is very possible that um, the user will make, a, um, will make a mistake by clicking on each um, or making a selection. So instead of save, you probably will click on undo, and it will undo everything that the user has done. So do not place semantically opposing entry or selection options close to each other. An example, as I said, it's a save and undo button. It should never be too close together. So set a placement is likely to produce frequency and loss inputs. It will be tired if you it. It fills a lengthy form and mistakenly presses on undo. It's quite an, an erroneous activity for, for the user. On the eighth and final one, you should have it in mind that the design of forms and dialogue boxes. So that is the eighth one, design of forms and dialogue boxes. So in this case, uh, most of the visual display layout guidelines also apply to the design of forms and also the um, dialogue boxes, you know, the line of dialogue boxes, the pop-ups that do come. Note that most of these guidelines apply only when using mouse keyboard driven graphical user. So situations become more complicated when other um, form of inputs are incorporated into the application or the design, such as touch, gestures, 3D selection, voice, and so on and so forth. 
So when we get to that level, there are separate guidelines for incorporating such inputs and modality into our OTI applications. So that is about taking user input. Now let's talk about users with disability. That is the user type. So the good thing is the W3C um, has led the web accessibility initiative and also published the web content accessibility guideline, which is the 2.0. Um, and here, um, this WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guideline, explains how to make web content more accessible to people with disability. Most of the time, people who are visually impaired. So, web content generally refers to the information in a web page or a web application. And some of these information can be in the form of text, image, forms, sound, videos, audios, and so on and so forth. So um, let me give a pictorial explanation to this in terms of the users with disability. So from the diagram that you see here, you can see that we have an adjustment feature for visually challenged users. The colors of the background and also the foreground test can be changed. So you can see here from on the website, there is a portion where you can increase the font. There are some website that has more fonts. So you have to find a way to increase the fonts. You give them the chance to increase the font. So in this way, if you click on this one, the font of the website will, will change and increase for somebody who finds it difficult to read set small fonts to appreciate the a bigger font. And of course, if the, the font is also too big, you can find a way to reduce it. So being visually impaired sometimes doesn't mean you are totally blind. But having some of these, some might not be able to see, so might be presbyopia and some might be myopic and all of that. Yes, that is why when we talk about web development, you place some of these, um, these information on the website, as I talked about, the text, the, the images, and the rest. When you have an image on a web page, you should at least have um, an alternate text for that image, so that if somebody who is heavily visually impaired Hoovers the mouse on the page will be able to know that the alternate text is there to let the user know that this is a picture of a girl who is playing a piano. Possibly that is a picture on the page that is being displayed. You can see from here, there's a picture of more of a family. So if the visually impaired individual hover over that, automatically the alt text will be able to matter out the um, the information to the visually impaired person. And of course, there are some sites. So this is, you can see this website and this website are the same thing. But you can see even now, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, and the rest, they all incorporate ACI guidelines in the application. That is how come we are able to, I am using WhatsApp dark mode. The thing is that, I think other people are using the standard ones. So this is a website that is more of a standard theme. And so everybody who would want the standard theme, some people would like to associate themselves with the website using the dark mode. But this is the same website because the user has been able to make a choice of the, um, of the color of the page, is able to see the web, same website, but in the different Theme. It's possible the brightness of the white pierces his eye. There are people like that. I remember um, um, there was a video on YouTube that was made by um, somebody I know. He got a message that your Photoshop tutorials 
are so good, but because of the thing that you use for it, it's difficult for him to to see what is going on. So he will, he proposed that in subsequent video tutorials he will incorporate a thing that is quite dark to make it easier for him to appreciate the tutorial that is going on. So of course. There are people that are visually impaired and have issues and will want to be able to access your site. So please, when you're developing sites for people, you should be thinking about some of these guidelines and principles to come out with the top of websites for the best experience for the users that visit them. Yes, I'm sure somebody will come out with very good um, ways to develop other types of websites internally by the in institution. I would love that. So still under users with disability, the following is a summary of the guidelines. So generally, these are some of the things that we touch on when we talk about users with disability. So the first one is perceivable. So by perceivable, these are the four things that we talk about. Being able to provide text alternative for non-text content. So any content which is not text, we should provide the alternatives. That is the alt attributes in an image tag when we develop with it web development. So the alt attributes is able to display the alternate text for the image that is being displayed. To be able to provide captions and other alternative, alternative for media or for multimedia like a video, we should be able to come out with the captions. And of course, um, we should be able to create as a piece of piece of um, perceivable, perceivable. The third one is we should be able to create content that can be presented in different ways, including by assistive technologies without losing its meaning. So the assistive technologies, I'm sure I'll talk about, I'll put up a video like of that for you to pick up um, and, and go through. Um, the next one is we should make it easy for users to see and also hear the content on our site. That is under the perceivables. Now, the second one is the operable. That is the user type for users with disability. Um, by operable, we should be able to make all functionality available from the keyboard. So we should give, so making it, so that gives a visually impaired individual to use the keyboard to navigate the site. Everything that we we'll do on the website, we should be able to use the keyboard to do that. If you are moving from one tab, one menu to the other, we should use that. People should be able to use the tab key to move from one point to the other on our page. We should give the users enough time to read and also use content. And by giving enough time to read and read, and there are times um, we have a website and the content. So, for instance, usually this one goes to the slide tool. So, you can have a slide show that contains some information or text. It is always best to have a slideshow displayed um, over a, let, um, a good amount of time before the next slideshow comes. So if I have a, <coughs> a slideshow on the website and I have our three pictures, the first picture containing text on the slideshow so the user should be able to give it, be given enough time to read the content on the slideshow before the next slideshow comes. And we should we should not use content that causes seizures. Um, um, seizures. Yeah, there are some people who are, are prone to the repetitive uh, display of light. So that is, I mean to say, the continuous blinking of light. And I think there is, um, there is a medical term for that. So when you put up pictures that keep blinking on your website, 
Um, this can cause such people to have seizures. They can collapse and probably have seizures on their top. Seizures. So you should be careful when you put up continuous blinking icons on the site. So do not use content that causes seizures. Help the users to navigate and also find content. Um, the next one is the um, understandable. Right? So we should be able to make text readable and understandable. We should make the content appear and operate in a predictable way. We should help the user avoid and also correct mistakes. So if you mistakenly clicks on something, we should be able to use a breadcrumb to go back to the previous page and also correct certain mistakes in the area of filling a form, the rest. So for instance, if you are filling an email address and you forgot to type the email address in the right formats, you should be able to be prompted and asked to fill in the right email address. Robust. Um, by the robust nature, we will mean to find ways to maximize the um, compatibility with the current and also the future user tools. So as I spoke in previous lectures, I was talking about the fact that uh, most of the things that we, we uh, most of the, the general ACI designs that we come out with by using the keyboards, the mouse, coming out with the GUIs, there are situations where it becomes more complicated when other forms of input and also inputs I use um, an example is a task gesture 3D voice when they are incorporated in this. And we need to find a, a different approach to be able to deal with incorporating such um, guidelines into our input modalities. So, by the robustness nature here, um, our application should be able to accommodate new of such um, future user tools so that it becomes very responsive and make it very easier for the future people to appreciate the application. And of course, we have versions of most of these applications. So as and when, you know, your application should be able to support the different versions that um, would, would come in future. So mobile devices, um, so recently with the spread of the smartphones and also usability and user experience of mobile devices and applications, there has, um, there has been even more, I mean, this has even been more important. And in this way, many of the conventional principles equally apply to mobile network devices. So we're going to display, I'm going to display a picture in here and talk about some few other things. So regarding the mobile devices, the following are more specific and important. Past status information. This is tailored to especially with regards to the network connectivity and also um, services. Minimize typing and leverage on varied input um, hardware, like the buttons, the touch, the voice, handwriting, and so on and so forth. Here starts focus for less confusion in a highly dense information space large gate targets, efficient use of screen space with condensed information. So let's look at this, um, these two pictures. So you can see the pictures here, A and B, is a comparison of two mobile game interfaces. So here, the initial, this is the initial entry screen for these two games. So for the first one, which is the A here, the uh, information and object density is needlessly high and distracting. So you can see 
when you launch the page, the, the game for the first time, you are seeing tiny forum, you are seeing more games, you are seeing start game, you are seeing welcome, you are seeing logouts. There are so many information being displayed here. And it is highly dense and needlessly dense, and has a high density. And it keeps distracting the user from doing, um, from knowing what to do at any point in time. But on the other hand, when you look at the second one, which is the B, we can see that we have a simple and minimal layout. So it's so simple and minimal layout. And the object size fitted to economic usage. That is the right one. So from here, when, you launch, when the game launches for the first time, the button that catches your attention is the play. Unlike this one, there are so many things that are being displayed that gets us more confused. So for mobile devices, platform type, there are certain things that we should have in mind. All right, so following, the following is a similar set of guidelines which is available for the Nokia developer homepage. Um, these are the three ones available. We have the enable shortcuts, keep the user informed of his or her action, and follow the device interface pattern. So from here, um, let's look out for the interface as we see in here. So this is a, this is a picture. These two pictures is a list view and also the detail view. So, this figure shows another design pattern, which um, was put forth by Google for the Android interface. You know, Android is a product of Google. So there's a design pattern that was put out by Google for the Android interface. So it concerns the limited and the different sizes of family of handheld devices. Handheld devices, the smartphones, the had life phones, the mobile internet device, and netbooks, and so on and so forth. And the more specifically suggests, and this by way more specifically suggests the use of panels um, as a way to achieve usability under such hardware constraints. So you make sure that your app consistently provides a balanced aesthetic pleasing layouts by adjusting its content to vary the screen size and the orientation. So irrespective of which of the handheld devices that you are using, smartphone, pad light, mobile, internet, netbooks, the application is quite responsive to make it easier for you to appreciate it. So for the panels, you can say they are a great way for your app to achieve most of these and they can allow you to combine multiple views into one compound view when a lot of these horizontal screen real estate is available by splitting them up when less space is available. So from here, you can see this is an Android design guideline promoting the use of list and also detail view. Detail view is the multiple panels that is being displayed to so efficiently use the screen size of the over device. So from here, you can see Rupa over here. There is a the list view, list all the contacts that we have in the user's phone. And by clicking on one of the contacts, we are taken to the detailed view that displays all the information about the user, the contacts, the phone number, the email address, and so on and so forth. So that is about the mobile device platform. So for icons, for Apple, and fonts for Windows XP upwards, so they are most of the main vendors. They publish star guides for user interaction elements in order to use for application running on their platform. So they always have to find a way to publish set guidelines. So for instance, for Apple, um, the Apple vendor, for instance, has published a design guidelines document that details how the application icons should be designed and also stylized or styled in a way. So the Apple design guidelines 
is as follows I'm going to talk about. There are three main of them. The first one is to try to balance eye appeal and the clarity of, a, of meaning in the icon so that um, it is rich and beautiful and clearly conveys the essence of the app's purpose. In, in the first one for the Apple guidelines, they try to balance our eye appeal to do all of this. Secondly, um, in, um, it investigates how the choice of image and also the color might be interpreted by people from different cultures. The third one is to create different size of app icons for different devices. So for iPhones and iPod Touch, both of the size, both of these sizes are required. iPhones, most of the time, we have to come out with an icon, we have a 57 by 57 pixel and a 114 by 114 pixel for a high resolution. When we talk about icons in iPhones. Now, on the other hand, in iPads, um, icons are developed using the 72 by 72 pixel and the 144 by 144 pixels for high resolution. So when the iOS, um, iOS displays the app icon on the home screen of a device, it automatically adds the following visual effects. The rounded corners, those that use iPhones, they see it. The rounded corners of the icons, and the drop shadows and the reflective style of the icon that is being displayed. And another example is the suggested choice of fonts or sizes for um, the Windows XP or application which is based on the Windows operating system. So these guidelines promote the organizational style and its identity. Ultimately, its consistency in user interfaces. So researchers found ways to use only for text over 14 points size. Um, it is used for headers and all, and should never be used for body text. So most of the things that we do, we normally use a Franklin Gothic. When we talk about XP, the font that is being used um, for text is um, it's over 14 points. And it's normally used for headers and should not, never be used for body text. So these are some guidelines that are being specified by Windows or Microsoft. The second one is Tahoma. The Tahoma font is used as a system default font. So any of the application that you install on a Windows environment, by default, it will have the Tahoma font. I'm talking about the Windows XP as the default font. And the Tahoma should be used at 8, 9, 11 point size. So these are ways to use it. We also have the fonts, which is the Vedana. Sometimes I use Vedana and Sansari for display of contents on the website. The so Vedana is used only for title bars of chair of floating palettes. You can check that, you can check some of these operating systems out and see the phones that are being used. Trebuchet MS, yes, the bold of Trebuchet MS at 10 points is usually used only for the title bars of Windows. So the Windows that is that we launch, any of the Windows that we launch normally uses the Trebuchet MS, the bold and 10 points. So this is an example of that. So in this example, you can see it's an example of trebuchet fonts, which is being used to write the my pictures for Windows title bar. So there's a title bar, and this is what is used. So trebuchet fonts, and this is the Microsoft XP design guidelines. And this was introduced in 2002. This is for Windows XP. 
All right. Um, so another example is the suggested choice of points the windows that I've talked about. The Franklin is used. I've talked about all of these ones. Um, the Verdana, the, the Trebuchet, MS Old, and the rest. So let's talk about the aircon. I, talk, I mentioned what the aircon is. The aircon design for oral interface. Um, some researchers have suggested a few guidelines for designing auditory analog to visual icons. So similar to the visual icons, which must capture the underlying meaning for whatever it is, it is trying to represent and draw attention for easy recognition. Earphones should be designed to be intuitive. So these suggest three types of earphones, namely those that are symbolic, those that are um, um, nomic, and those that are metaphoric. So for those that are symbolic, um, such earphones rely on social conversions such as applause for approval. And so that is about the symbolic ones. For the nomic, and the nomic ones are physical such as a door slam, and the metaphoric ones are based on capturing the similarity such as a falling pitch for a falling object. So the oral feedback, that has got to do with the ear, listening, hearing. The oral feedback, which includes the earphones, involves a careful choice of sound-related uh, parameters such as the amplitude and loudness, amplitude or the loudness, frequency or the pitch, the timbre, and the duration. These are very key when we design oral interfaces and the ear code. Um, so, Green et al. in their research some time back um, also tried to categorize outline interface guidelines for automobiles and vehicles who interfaces are nowadays more electronic and also computer controlled. Like Tesla cars and most of the cars, the new cars that are um, in, the, in the system now. So the table three actually gives a, a detail of that. So you can see table 2.3 that's a sample of the guidelines for the car phone interface in vehicles. So we have the subcategory of the guidelines. The basic, the voice dialogue, the manual dialing. So these are some examples that have been specified in here. So the category includes design guidelines for manual control, spoken inputs and outputs, visual and auditory display, navigation guides, guides, cell phones, concentration to name just a few. And that has been represented here. So that is figure 2.9, the full interface for auto mobile. So that is what you see here, this is the interface and that is being represented here. So that category, what it does is um, include design guidelines for manual control, booking inputs, and auditory display and cell phone concentration, as you see in here. So this is how the phone control is being displayed on the dashboard of the, of the car. So for e-commerce, as you see, also other researchers like um, Girls Big has collected and also formulated very expensive, detailed, and structured ACI guidelines for e-commerce applications. So from his research, he proposed that a total of 404 guidelines structures in four groups. And these were the general input output forms, user 
element and um, checkout process. These four guidelines or structures are given and applied to several real systems for validation evaluation. So the following, as you see here, are the guidelines under the checkout process session concerning the steps of the subtax, that is the checkout process. So first of all, the checkout should start at the shopping cart, followed by the gift option or the shipping method, the shipping address, the billing address, the payment information, the order review, and finally, um, an order summary. Then when this is done, the site displays a confirmation page and gives the customer the option to register. The checkout process is linear in this case. So um, the figure, as you see, a figure 10, 2.10, it shows the status information that is, that is what is circled in here, um, shown in the process of a book purchase at Amazon.com. So in summary, um, what we've talked about today, uh, we should have it in mind that all most of these guidelines specific or generous seem quite straightforward and are easy to understand. Incorporating them in actual design and um, implementation is quite difficult. So many of these guidelines are still at quite a high level. Um, and these are also similar to the ACR principles. And they leave that um, the developer wondering how to actually apply them in practice. So these are guidelines that we have in mind. These are principles that we have in mind. That is quite difficult to implement in all of these. But the most important thing is the guidelines, at least guides you when you are developing it. You might not have a perfect system, but it's a way to go. So another reason is that um, there is just too many different aspects to consider, especially for a large scale system. You have to consider so many of these guidelines and principles. Quite voluminous. So sometimes the guidelines can even be in conflict with each other. Yeah. So in that case, it will require patronizing. Um, it, it will require a way to, you know, find a way to prioritize on the part of the design. So in that case, so for the designer or, for instance, let's say, it will be very difficult to give contrast to an item for highlighting its importance when one is restricted to use certain colors. If you are restricted to use some colors, of course, you can't highlight an item that is so, so important. So example for a corporate entity uh, purpose. Another example would be um, when attempting to introduce a new interface technology, for example, like touch gestures. Trust me, it is so difficult. It will be very difficult. So while these new interfaces may have possibly proven um, effective in the laboratory, or theoretically, it may require significant familiarizing and also um, training, enough training on the part of the user. So most of the time it is often the case that um, the external constraints such as the monetary and also the human resource restricts sound ACR practice. So there is a straight answer to how set conflicts can be managed and also how to incorporate all the requirements simultaneously, particularly under the stringent external constraints. So one must realize that all the designs involve compromising and also trading off. You can't implement all of them. So you can, by the guidelines and the principles that you know, you can trade off some of the guidelines and you can compromise in using some of them. So um, most of the time, the experienced designers understands the ultimate benefits and the cost for practicing sound ATI design. 
in spite of the knowledge aspect of the blackout to ACI design. Um, the ACI guideline itself um, still helps greatly to ensure overall usability and also performance. So these are um, some of the things that we should have in mind. And there will be a presentation in a class where I'm sure next week I will let you know, or in the next slides I will let you know those the groups that will at least do a presentation of an application that they have developed and how some of the principles and guidelines are being incorporated in HCI. So you should be in the lookout for such. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, we are not in class, so there wouldn't be anybody to summarize. But I would want you to go over the videos as and when you get a chance. Thank you.